This life, the way we know it, is constructed in such a way that there's enormous significance to the ring finger. I don't believe that other lives could be made the same way. If you want to open up the whole cosmic process, you can open it up with this ring finger. They were going for this, that means either they know about it or they sensed it or it is from them that we know all this, whichever way it is. But they were not ignorant of it. They know our ways or they taught us these ways or they made us this way. We don't know how much role they have played in our making. Before we talk about Shiva, let's first watch Sadhguru's video. As demented and deformed beings. So somebody will look demented and deformed to you if they don't look like you. So, there were people around Shiva all the time. His friends were always deformed beings. No, they were just different. They just were different. They were different because they didn't belong to this planet anyway, they came with him. Only he took on the human form. The stories clearly say that only sometimes he was a Sundaramurti, that means he was a very handsome, wonderful man. Otherwise, he was also a hideous being. So sometimes he took on the form of a wonderful, absolutely resplendent human form. Otherwise, sometimes he was also like that. And there are not a single story of suggesting anything about his childhood, not a single story about his old age or death or grave or parentage. It is clearly said that he has no parents, no father is understood, no mother, not understood by anybody, isn't it? Because he didn't belong here. He came from elsewhere, his friends hung around him and he came and went, always repeatedly the stories, just two days ago was Vinayak Chaturthi, did you know all of you? Vinayaka means the Ganapati. You know Ganapati, the elephant-headed god, that was his festival two days ago. That was the day his head was chopped and he got an elephant head. This happened because Shiva left Parvati on the banks of Manasarovar and disappeared for over ten years or more maybe. He went away, which he was doing very constantly. He was here for a while and he was gone. When he was gone, Parvati just being alone, she wanted to have a child and there is a curse that she can never have a child. You need to understand, Shiva never fathered any child. And the stories clearly say, no woman could hold his semen in her womb because he was not human. So Parvati could never have a child, she knew that. So she took sandal paste, made the form of a little child and breathed life into it through the tantric process. This child became alive and she fed and brought up this child. This boy became ten years of age. 10, 11 or 12 years of age, around that kind, a young boy. And he was guarding Parvati. Parvati was having bath. She said, don't let anybody this decide, whoever comes, stop them. Shiva was gone for 10, 12 years and he came back. When the boy tried to stop him, he got angry and chopped his head off. That means he was away for 10, 12 years time. Every time he went away, all these other people who were with him, who were distorted or different people, 
they were all gone. When he came back, they all came. And there's another story how Kartikeya was born. Kartikeya means Subramanya or Muruga was born. Once again it is said, because Shiva was made in such a way that he could not impregnate or have his child and people had the desire to see that someone like this becomes alive, he dropped his semen into the sacrificial fire, into your homa. And from that it was taken and six apsaras, apsaras means women who are not human, who come from elsewhere, took this and they couldn't hold it and three-month-old babies they delivered. And these three-month-old fetuses were kept in lotus leaves and nurtured and then Parvati merged all the six and made them into one. This is how the story goes. All these things suggest that he came from elsewhere, did what he wanted to do and went back and periodically he went and came at different times. This could have happened over many thousand years, still coming and going, still coming and going. In the Shiva Sutra, one of the shlokas says, refers to Shiva as Yaksha Swarupa. Yaksha means an alien being. This culture is full of such stories, how these beings visited this planet. They are referring to Shiva as a yaksha, that means he came from outside. This is the first reference I saw, a direct reference where it says, Shiva is an yaksha swarupa, he is not human. So, when I… when we went to Manasar over this time, the moment I went there, I felt such a tug, it was like Literally these beings were just after my ring finger. They were just going at my ring finger with so much force and so much doggedly going at it. And as far as I know, because I know this life, this life, the way we know it is constructed in such a way that there's enormous significance to the ring finger. I don't believe that other lives could be made the same way. The whole system of yoga understood the significance of how to master the ring finger. This is like your master key to the cosmos. If you want to open up the whole cosmic process, you can open it up with this ring finger. They were going for this, that means either they know about it or they sensed it or it is from them that we know all this, whichever way it is. But they were not ignorant of it. They know our ways or they taught us these ways or they made us this way. We don't know how much role they have played in our making but definitely the impact of what he did and the whole science of yoga that he propounded didn't come from here. There was a deeper understanding elsewhere and it was just brought to us. He came at a certain time as a youth and he left as a youth. He was not born here nor did he die here. The concept of connecting ancient deities such as Shiva to extraterrestrial beings is largely associated with fringe theories, pseudo-scientific claims and speculative interpretations that lack empirical evidence. While there are popular books that explore these ideas, it's crucial to note that these works are not endorsed within the scientific community and are often criticized for their methodological flaws, lack of scholarly rigor and reliance on selective interpretations of religious texts and archaeological evidence. Chariots of the Gods by Eric von Daniken Selective Interpretation Critics argue that von Daniken engages in selective interpretation of archaeological artifacts and cultural practices 
often cherry picking elements that seem to fit his extraterrestrial hypothesis while ignoring alternative explanations grounded in historical cultural context lack of archaeological rigor mainstream archaeologists and historians note the absence of rigor archaeological methodology in von daniken's work his claims often lack empirical evidence and fail to consider the complexities of ancient societies the 12th planet by zakaria sitchin linguistic criticisms scholars specializing in sumerian language and cuneiform writing have extensively criticized sitchin's translations many argue that his interpretations contain inaccuracies and he takes liberties with the meanings of ancient texts to align them with his extraterrestrial narrative astronomical speculation sitchin's concept of the 12th planet nibiru has no basis in mainstream astronomy Astronomers argue that if such a celestial body existed in our solar system with the proposed orbital characteristics it would have been detectable through telescopic observations Gods of Eden by William Bramley Conspiracy theories Bramley's work incorporates elements of conspiracy theories a methodology often criticized for lacking empirical evidence and relying on speculative narratives Scholars argue that attributing historical events to secretive extraterrestrial influences oversimplifies complex human developments. Neglect of historical context. Critics point out that Bramley often neglects the nuanced historical and cultural context in which events unfolded, favoring sensationalized extraterrestrial connections over well-established historical explanations. The Spaceships of Ezekiel by Joseph F. Blumrich. Scholars of religious studies criticize Blumrich for his literal interpretation of symbolic religious texts. They argue that religious texts often use metaphorical language and a literal interpretation can lead to misrepresentations of the intended meanings. Anachronistic engineering analysis While Blumrich's engineering background adds an air of technical credibility, critics contend that applying modern engineering principles to ancient texts is an anachronistic approach that overlooks the symbolic nature of religious visions. Forbidden Archaeology by Michael A. Cremo and Richard L. Thompson Departure from scientific methodology, mainstream archaeologists argue that forbidden archaeology departs from established scientific methodologies. The book is criticized for neglecting the principles of stratigraphy, contextual analysis, and peer-reviewed research, opting instead for a presentation of anomalies without a comprehensive consideration of alternative explanations. Selective use of evidence. Critics note that Cremio and Thompson selectively present evidence that aligns with their narrative while downplaying or ignoring data that contradicts their extraterrestrial hypothesis. In summary, these works face multifaceted criticisms including issues related to selective interpretation, lack of archaeological rigor, linguistic inaccuracies, and a departure from accepted scientific methodologies. The scientific community emphasizes the importance of evidence-based inquiry and scholarly rigor and the majority rejects the idea that ancient deities including Shiva have direct connections to extraterrestrial beings a nuanced and contextually grounded understanding of ancient cultures is encouraged rather than imposing selective narratives lacking empirical support